moving into a series of technical talks. Um, we selected the three. Well, I think you'll be able to judge that they, for this audience, we thought that they were particularly relevant. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Professor Harry Campbell from the University of Edinburgh. Okay, thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, and thanks for inviting me here. Thanks for coming. Um, I'd like to thank also PLOS Medicine for giving a platform for this important work. And I'd like to thank, in particular, Lucy Chapel at PLOS Medicine for her help in editing the, the papers I was involved in. So I'd like to talk about the work measuring coverage of the treatment of childhood pneumonia. And I'd like to focus more on our thought processes and how we tackled this, rather than all the details of the results which are in the papers. So let me take you back 100 years to the city of Chicago. This is in 1911, and this is the Department of Health in the city of Chicago, identifying the preventable perils surrounding the child. And you'll see the skeletons here are, include pneumonia, measles, diarrhea disease. And this poster was posted up in the city of Chicago, and it says three things, really. The first thing it says is child mortality is too high. Um, the second thing it says is that most of the causes are preventable, even back in 1911. And the third thing it says is, to break this ring of trouble, more men and more money are required. So it's essentially saying, <laughs> we need support to scale up what we know works. I was in this room three, three weeks ago um, for the, global, the launch of the Global Action Plan for the prevention and control of pneumonia and diarrhea. And these are exactly, exactly the messages of the Global Action Plan 100 years later. So child pneumonia death remains a preventable peril. In terms of child deaths, pneumonia accounts for about 18% of child deaths. This is taken from the Lancet paper by Blob Black and Cherg in 2012. And the, the Lancet uh, paper just two weeks ago from Krista Fisher-Walker noted that that's 1.3 million child deaths from pneumonia in 2011. In terms of what works and interventions, the, the review f by Zulfikar Bhutta, again a couple of weeks ago in The Lancet, was the most comprehensive review of interventions against pneumonia. It looked at environmental, nutritional, vaccine and treatment interventions, as well as delivery platforms. And one of its main messages was that pneumonia case management with antibiotics is a key strategy to reduce pneumonia mortality. Okay, so... Pneumonia case management's important, uh, antibiotic treatment's a strategy. We need to scale this up and we need to track our progress. The trouble is that tracking that progress is not so easy. And this is something that Jennifer, I think, recognised a number of years ago and has really pioneered getting more attention to this important issue. And this issue was also picked up, as, as Mariam was mentioning, by Bill Gates in his annual letter this year. This annual letter... Uh, focused on the Gates' um, uh, support for global polio eradication, but its other main message was measurement, 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 giving examples of why measurement's important. And he stated, in the past year, I've been struck again and again by how important measurement is to improving the human condition. You can achieve amazing progress if you set cl a clear goal and find a measure that will drive progress towards that goal in a feedback loop. This may seem pretty basic, but it's amazing to me how often it's not done and how hard it is to get it right. So here's our challenge for pneumonia. We want to measure the percentage of children with pneumonia who receive antibiotic treatment. Here's another figure from a Lancet paper again three weeks ago. This one was by Harish Nair. And I don't want to go through the details of this figure. I put it up just because I think it's an interesting figure you may want to look at. But let me tell you what Harish did. He assembled a network of investigators in low-income countries who had unpublished data on pneumonia. And he got them to agree to share this data in a standard format. And then he triangulated various pieces of data on pneumonia incidence, on severe pneumonia incidence, on pneumonia mortality, on case fatality ratios, and on hospitalization rates for pneumonia. And from that analysis in this figure, he estimated that 35% of severe pneumonia cases do not reach hospital, and 81% of pneumonia deaths occur outside of the hospital. 
So the message for us here in measuring this percentage of children with pneumonia who receive antibiotic treatment is simply that we cannot possibly assess this indicator just with hospital studies. There needs to be a community survey. Okay, so now we have our community survey to measure pneumonia treatment rate. How do we go about that? Well, I work in a university, and one of the first things you learn in a university is your grant is not going to be funded if you don't do a sample size calculation. So when you start off your study, you have to ask how big is this study going to be? So if you want to express a treatment rate of 50%, say, with a precision of plus or minus 5%, you would need a study of 385 children with pneumonia. Of course, you could do a smaller study, but you get a fuzzy estimate. And the trouble with fuzzy estimates is if you're trying to track something over time and show a change, then fuzzy estimates don't really work terribly well. The best estimates we have of pneumonia incidence come from the, the, um, the work by Igor Rudan and colleagues, about 0.3 episodes per child per year. So if we put that in the context of a survey asking about cases in the last two weeks, as happens in DHS and Mix, you would need a survey of about 10,000 children to detect these, to, to include these 120 cases. And you need a very large survey to include the 385 cases of pneumonia. The absolute numbers here are not important. Um, as any researcher will tell you, you can tweak these parameters to get the sample size you first thought of. But the main message, <clears throat> the main message is that you need a large-scale survey to measure this indicator. And really, DHS and MIX are the only surveys that are currently widely, widely conducted at this scale. So let's look at DHS and MIX and how they approach this question. Well, the first thing is, perhaps surprisingly, is they don't deal with pneumonia. Um, the trouble we have is that we don't have a rapid diagnostic test for pneumonia. We have to deal, uh, as DHS and MIX have done, with a proxy measure of pneumonia. And the proxy measure they've um, dealt with is the caregiver report of a child with signs consistent with pneumonia, so fast and difficult breathing where the mother thinks this is coming from the chest. And you take these uh, children and you ask about whether these children had, were treated with an antibiotic. Is this approach valid? This is what our study, this is the question our study addressed. And I think, again, it was the, the foresight of, of Jennifer to see that this is actually an important question and no one's been looking at this. Uh, so, and this d demands some attention. These indicators are important. We need to know their validity. It's a simple question, but it's one that needs to have some attention. So we set up these studies in Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, three studies, the one in Pakistan led by Dr. Tawish Hazir and the one in Bangladesh led by Shams El Arafin. And we recruited 950 children who had confirmed pneumonia and 980 children who had cough but who did not have pneumonia. And these were recruited by medical officers that, we, that were trained specifically um, to make the diagnosis of pneumonia or not pneumonia. And then these children were all followed up at home after two or four weeks by field workers independently and they carried out the part of the DHS and MIX survey that focuses on pneumonia. We also attested some alternative methods, including uh, a video showing children with pneumonia. So instead of asking the mother about signs, of, uh, signs and symptoms of pneumonia, we actually showed the mother a child with pneumonia and a child who had a cough and cold and a blocked nose and asked the mother which her child most resembled. And we also looked at a drug chart illustrating locally available antibiotics. So rather than asking the mother about whether the child received an antibiotic, we would show pictures of locally available antibiotics and ask the mother to if the child had received this. So key findings. The DHS mix questions had a sensitivity for pneumonia of 50 to 70 percent. They had a specificity for pneumonia of about 70 percent. And surprisingly, we didn't really find any difference at all between two-week recall and four-week recall. So this is saying really that 50 to 70 percent of children with pneumonia, the caregiver reported these signs uh, of suspected pneumonia. But also in about 30 percent of children who didn't have <coughs> pneumonia, there was also a, a, a maternal or a caregiver report of these signs. In terms of 
correct recall of antibiotic treatment, this was around 67%. Um, and when we used the video and drug charts, the performances were a little bit better. They weren't remarkably better, but they were a bit better with these new methods. For example, the treatment recall increased from 67 to 72%. So how can we think of a context to interpret these study results? Well, let's go back to uh, a survey of 10,000 children. And as I've already said, in a survey of 10,000 children, we would expect there would be about... 120 of these children had pneumonia in the previous two weeks. And we know from epidemiological estimates that there are at least 10 cases of children who have cough and cold for every one case of pneumonia, somewhere between 10 and 20. But for the purposes of this, let's say it's 10. So let's put this... Oh, right, this is not... Uh, um, this figure hasn't shown in this. So... Um, uh, yeah, what's a good idea? Yeah. No, for some reason it hasn't shown up. Um, Is it in the paper and they can open their books and look at it? It's not in the paper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no what I'd like, what, there is a figure here that, that puts the 70% sensitivity and specificity into the context of um, a, a survey of 10,000 children with 120 children having pneumonia and 1,200 children having cough and cold. So there are 10 times as many with cough and cold. And when you apply a sensitivity and specificity, uh, a 70% sensitivity and specificity, um, what you find is that the DHS and MIX surveys would pick up 444 children that have these signs consistent with pneumonia. And that number of 444 is quite different to the 120 children that we know had pneumonia. So first uh, lesson really is that this, this um, estimate of the number of children who have signs consistent with pneumonia is quite different to the number of children who have pneumonia. So it would not be appropriate to, to use that estimate in this way. But more importantly, in terms of an, uh, uh, looking at the antibiotic treatment rate, um, of the 444 children um, that have symptoms and signs consistent with pneumonia, only 84 of them really have pneumonia. So only 19% of this group actually have pneumonia. And if this group is the basis for us looking at antibiotic treatment rate, it's a problem that only 19% of them actually have pneumonia. So why is it a problem? Well, let's consider an ideal pr program. An ideal program would be where 100% of these 120 pneumonia cases were actually treated with antibiotics and 0% of the 1,200 children with cough and cold who don't have pneumonia would be treated with antibiotics. This would be an ideal scenario. And if we had perfect recall of treatment by caregivers, the treatment rate amongst children with reported signs consistent with pneumonia would be 19%. So here we have a perfect program and the, the indicator here is measuring 19%. And if a program interpreted this as poor coverage of antibiotic treatment and wanted to take action to increase antibiotic coverage, then this would be inappropriate because all it would do would be to drive overuse of antibiotics. Um, So one of the bottom line messages from the study is we should avoid calling this indicator pneumonia treatment rate. This uh, is not really a, a, a true reflection of the actual pneumonia treatment rate. So here's a, a, report, a, a past report from an international agency reporting children under five with pneumonia who received antibiotics, um, data from 27 DHS countries. This is not really a pneumonia treatment rate. Um, if we take the 19% here that's uh, quoted as the summary estimate from these 27 countries, the problem is that that 19% is consistent with 100% of the 120 pneumonia cases being treated with antibiotics and none of the 12, 
hundred children with cough and cold uh, not be, uh, being treated with antibiotics, so a perfect programme. But it's also consistent with 10% of the pneumonia cases being treated with antibiotics and 21% of the children with cough and cold being treated with antibiotics. So it's not really a parameter that helps guide programmes about where the, the performance of their programme is at the moment. We should also take care in interpreting this indicator as pneumonia treatment rate. This um, table shows a, another international agency coming up with a report card for pneumonia, and it, it, um, it shows pneumonia death rates, it shows vaccine coverage, it shows exclusive breastfeeding coverage, and it has the percentage of children with suspected pneumonia. So that's, cor that's more correct. It's not claiming this is a uh, percentage of children with pneumonia, but it's still interpreting the data as if it were children, percentage of children with pneumonia. And as I've mentioned, it, it's, it's really not valid to do this um, because of the problems that I've, I've shown. So our future work is to check these findings. We think that we should do further studies in Africa uh, to check that these findings are replicated in different epidemiological settings. And we'd like to do work to explore other, other measures. We plan to continue to try to develop improved or at alternative indicators. So I'd like to thank uh, Tawish Hazir and his team in Pakistan, Shams El Arafin and his team in Bangladesh, uh, Shamim Kazi and Jennifer, uh, the PLOS Medicine Collection Team, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for the funding for the study, and the support team at Johns Hopkins. Thank you.